let's talk about types of real estate. So really, you kind of have two buckets. Really, there's a third industrial, but we're not going to talk about industrial. We're going to talk about residential and commercial. So single family, this is uh, your typical home. Most of us can uh, think of real estate, at least for me. When I was first thinking of investing in real estate, I thought, well, I'll just go buy another house. I'll rent it out. I'll take care of the things that come up, and then I'll make some money off of it. And by the time you figure it out, you might make $100 or $200 a month, and it's a lot of work for that small amount of money. Uh, with values increasing so much recently, it's going to be tough to be able to make the mortgage payment and have any profit actually left over. So then you can start to scale and start getting the two or three or four plex. That's this type of uh, community or apartment complex. It's a, it's a duplex or a triplex. You'll hear those terms. And then you get in a large multifamily, which is 20 plus units, even down 10 plus apartment units, um, 20 to 200 or 500. You can get really big into those. And the real distinction becomes the type of loan that you get. So typically in this space, you're getting a traditional single family loan from a, a, a regular lender. They're going to use your income that you have from your job to qualify for that debt, qualify for that loan. Once you get into larger properties, you can now offset. You still have to have income on your side. You still have to have net, net worth and value, but you can also use the income from the property to qualify for that. And that's where it gets really exciting because you get better terms, you get better leverage. Uh, so it's a really nice way to build wealth and also scale, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, other types of commercial real estate, office hospitality. So think of office buildings, you know, large uh, facilities, even hospitals, uh, even uh, entertainment centers. Those are all buildings that are not always owned by the operator. They're owned by somebody else. So you can be uh, a landlord for uh, potentially a stadium. You can think of retail shopping centers. Most of these folks don't own their properties outright. They just lease the space. And so you can be a landlord of retail. And then you have REITs, which is essentially a mutual fund of lots of properties smashed together. And you're buying a piece of that or a share of that uh, in what they call a real estate investment trust, R-E-I-T, REIT. All right, let's compare assets. So let's just compare a 50 unit apartment complex to a, a single family home portfolio. So I got four homes on this side, 50 apartments on this side. And again, this is where a lot of us start and it's completely good. But if you want to grow and scale and again, build long-term wealth without buying yourself another job, this is a good way to look at it or think about it. So we have a, you know, essentially self-managed property, um, one vacancy. So just one of these goes vacant for a little bit of time. And now you have 25% vacancy or 75% occupancy. Kind of tough. It's really hard to scale to 50 houses. One of the reasons it's hard is are you, unless you're going to buy an entire neighborhood, which is pretty hard to do. Your homes are going to be spread all throughout the country, the city, the county, the state. It just depends, but it's not going to be in one area. The apartment complex, you're going to be multiple buildings, but it's going to be one complex, one place, one location. You can send contractors there. You can have staff there if need be. You can have it all in one place. Yes, there's going to be you know mechanical, electrical issues in all of these, but you know technically we say one roof versus four or five roofs. The big piece is vacancies. So if I have 10 vacancies out of here, that means 40 units are occupied. I can still pay my mortgage for sure, all the way down to 60%. And I use this number, not arbitrarily, but I use this number because when we look at deals, we want to make sure that our break-even point, the break-even point means when do rents go all the way down to the point where we can pay our expenses and still pay our mortgage and break even. Now that's 60%. That means 20 units, 20 units would be vacant and we would still be able to pay the bills. If you had that all the way down, it would be close to half of these would be gone question is, are the profits from these two enough to pay the mortgage for all four? Because the bank doesn't care. They still want the mortgage paid, right? Um, what that means is there's just less risk when you do that. Um, it's a higher impact on value creation. I'll talk about that next slide. And this is the big piece. The value of this apartment complex is based on income, net income, not comps. So not comparables of single family, for example. These homes are not going to be in the same neighborhood, likely. So wherever the this home is, it's value based on what other properties are selling for. So you could have done all of the work, you could have done some major improvements, but those improvements may not designate or give you higher rents, possibly, but most likely that when you go to sell it or go to the bank to evaluate it, they're going to say, well, the homes in the area are worth X, your home is worth X because it's the same size, same bedroom, et cetera. Multifamily, I could have two exactly the same properties right next to each other. One could produce higher net income and therefore be valued at a higher uh, higher amount, not only for the market, but also for the bank. So that's a really good reason that we choose multifamily. Let's use an example. There's a term called forced appreciation. 
So that means I'm going out and I'm not waiting on the market to do this. I'm not counting on the market cycle to go to increase the value. I'm going in and I'm doing something to improve the property. So an example would be increasing the rent on a 50 unit complex by $25. Now we don't just arbitrarily raise rent. You would likely provide some amenity. We would make some improvements. So this would be an example of, of uh, having Wi-Fi uh, for the entire complex. So adding Wi-Fi in, okay, now tenant comes in, it's $25 more per rent, but they don't have to worry about Wi-Fi. Let's see, for, let's just say, right? So let's use this example, $25, 12 months, 50 units. That's $15,000 in additional net income. Now that net income goes right to the bottom line because whatever this profit is, if there's a cost, it's less than that. This is my actual profit for that. I take that 15,000 and I divide it by what they call a market cap rate. And this is a capitalization rate. We don't set it. The apartment doesn't set it. It's set by the marketplace. And your broker, anybody in the market will be familiar with what the market rate is or market cap rate is for this type of asset in this particular city. Divide that by 5%. And that gives you $300,000 in value. So we paid $5 million for this property. And in just a year, we're able to raise the value of it in just this area by 6%. So 6% growth in value by doing one thing, one $25 item. Let's add to that. Let's go, let's say we go and we renovate some of these units, not all of them, but just some of them. And then we can capture $150 to $200 more by renovating them. So you'll have new flooring, new cabinets, et cetera, right? And so you'll see that there's a $150 increase in value times 12 months. We only did that on 25 units. So that's $45,000 in additional income. And again, we use that same cap rate. Now that's almost $900,000 in value. So you add that to it. And now we spent $200,000 for those units. So we have a good break even, but we've raised the value by $900,000. So you take 5.9 divided by five. We've increased the value 18%. And so there's lots of little buckets to be able to take and do to improve the value of a commercial property. If I did that to a single family property, I might still get a good return, but again, it might be dictated on what the neighborhood is doing, right? So if I over-improve an asset, I'm not going to necessarily capture the benefit.